Welcome to this Configure Terminal presentation. My name is David Bombal, CCIE 11023. This is a short sample from our CCNA training course, which you can find at ConfigureTerminal.com. I hope you enjoy this quick sample from our CCNA training course. Well, in 1976, two gentlemen, Diffie and Hellman, discovered a way out of the secure channel dilemma. In other words, the issue we had with the transmission of a shared secret across an insecure medium can be solved by using Diffie-Hellman. They found out that by using a different key, certain one-way functions could be undone. Their solution called public key cryptography takes advantage of a characteristic of prime and almost prime numbers, specifically how hard it is to find the two factors of a large number that has only two factors, both of which are prime. This uses things like quadratic residues. Now, unless you're a mathematician, that'll have no meaning, I'm sure. Now, once again, we as network engineers do not need to understand the math behind all of these algorithms. We just have to know when to apply the algorithms in production environments. So just understand that Diffie-Hellman discovered a way to securely create a secure channel to exchange a shared secret key which is required by algorithms like AES, triple DES and DES across an insecure medium like the internet securely so that no hacker can find out what the shared secret is. In brief, the way Diffie-Hellman works is as follows. The peers, in other words the two devices involved in a VPN, can yield or create a shared secret key based on the other peer's public value and their own secret. In other words, if you and I are going to set up a VPN and we need to create a shared secret key between us, by using complicated mathematics, we can create a shared secret securely without other people being able to work out what that key is. You need at least one secret value to perform this function or calculation. Remember, secret or private keys are not exchanged with other people so the attacker has no secret values and needs to perform a discrete logarithm of a public value which is computationally infeasible. In other words, in theory, impossible. So for example, here's some clear text data that we want to send securely using an algorithm like AES. AES being a symmetric key algorithm requires that the same key be used for encryption and decryption. We want to be able to work out a shared secret key between the sender and receiver securely across an insecure medium with all kinds of undesirables trying to sniff the network and work out what the password is. So both peers need to establish a shared key securely and Diffie-Hellman gives us the ability to do this. So by using public key cryptography, in other words private and public keys, we can work out a shared secret securely without others being able to see that. So when two peers want to set up a VPN, they use Diffie-Hellman to work out a shared key. The reason why we need that shared key is symmetric key algorithms like AES require that the same key be used on both sides and the reason why we use AES is because it's good for bulk encryption. Once the Diffie-Hellman key exchange has taken place, we can create a shared secret for AES and therefore AES and the shared key can be used for bulk encryption of our data which can be sent across the insecure internet securely and only decrypted by the receiving party. Diffie-Hellman comes in different forms. Diffie-Hellman 1 is 768 bits in length. Diffie-Hellman 2 is 1024 bits in length. Diffie-Hellman 5 is 1536 bits in length. Once again, the longer the key length, the more secure. But the downside is, more processing power would be required. Now just to reiterate, asymmetric key algorithms are used in VPNs today not for bulk encryption of data, but they help with the establishment of a shared secret. They are also used for other things like authentication, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Symmetric key algorithms such as AES 
are used for bulk encryption of data. So we've covered confidentiality or encryption. Let's look at the second goal which is integrity. We want to ensure that data has not been tampered with. In other words, we want to know that the data has traversed the internet or other network unchanged between the two parties. Data integrity uses algorithms known as hashing algorithms, also known as trapdoor or message digests. These are one-way algorithms, unlike encryption algorithms, which can be reversed. Hashing algorithms convert arbitrary data into a fixed length hash. An example would be MD5 or Message Digest Algorithm 5, which has a fixed length of 128 bits. Now to demonstrate hashing, notice I can take a piece of arbitrary information, let's say my name, and I can hash it, in this case using SHA. SHA, or Secure Hash Algorithm, is more secure than MD5. This is the hexadecimal value for SHA and the binary value. For SHA. Notice if I change one value, for instance making that David 1, and hash it again, notice the entire hash changes, but notice it's of a fixed length. I could put a bunch of people's names in there. And hash it again. Notice the entire hash changes but is of a fixed length. I could go and copy some text from let's say USA Today. Arbitrary length. Paste it in. Hash it. I could take the Encyclopedia Britannica, put it through an MD5 hash and come up with 128 bits. So for example, I could take that US Today article, put it into an MD5 hash generator, and notice it'll come up with a 128-bit hash value. Or I could replace that with, let's just say, my name. And it'll come up with a 128-bit hash value. Hashing is non-reversible because data is lost. You cannot take a 128-bit MD5 hash reverse it and come up with the Encyclopedia Britannica, but you can take the Encyclopedia Britannica, hash it and come up with a 128-bit value. Please note that the hash will change as I've demonstrated if any part of the input value changes. So with hashing we can take data of arbitrary length, put it through an MD5 or SHA hash, in this case it's MD5, and come up with a fixed 128-bit hash value. You cannot take the 128-bit hash value and reverse the process and come up with the original data. It is a one-way function or trapdoor function. There are various hashing algorithms that can be used. MD5 once again is 128 bits. MD5 is not recommended today in networking environments. SHA-1 is 160 bits in length. SHA-2 is 256 or 512 bits in length and SHA-3 is scheduled for release in 2012. Just be aware that there are various hashing algorithms once again. SHA-2 is what's recommended in today's networking environments. So as an example, if Peter wanted to send data to Sarah ensuring confidentiality and integrity, the following would happen. Peter's private information that no one else except Sarah should read is encrypted firstly with an encryption algorithm like AES. Now in this case we're assuming that a shared secret or shared key has been derived. So assuming that that's happened, Peter can encrypt the data using a symmetric key algorithm like AES. So the clear text information is encrypted into ciphertext. This provides confidentiality. Peter then takes the encrypted text or ciphertext and hashes it with a hashing algorithm like SHA or MD5 which comes up with a fixed length hash. This will ensure data integrity. 
because if any part of the data is changed, remember the hash will also change. So Peter takes the clear text, encrypts it with an algorithm like AES to come up with ciphertext. He hashes that encrypted text and comes up with a hash. He then appends the hash to the encrypted ciphertext and sends it to Sarah. Sarah, upon receipt of the data, in this case the encrypted ciphertext, wants to make sure that the data hasn't been tampered with before going through all the effort of decrypting the text. So Sarah will take the encrypted text and hash it herself to come up with a MD5 or SHA hash. She will then compare the hash that she derived with the hash appended to the encrypted data. Only if the hashes are the same does she bother decrypting the text. Now if the hashes are the same, it means that the data hasn't changed in transit. If the hashes are the same, Sarah can decrypt the data by reversing the AES encryption knowing that the data hasn't been tampered with. However, that being said, what stops Joe Hacker receiving the data, changing it, so manipulating the data before it reaches Sarah, encrypting it with AES, hashing that fake data with let's say SHA and appending a new hash to the data and then transmitting it to Sarah. Sarah has no way of knowing that the data has been manipulated because when she reverses the process by hashing this new data, her hash will be the same as Joe Hacker's hash that he appended to the new data. So to combat that, what Peter needs to do is use something called Hash Message Authentication Code or HSMAC and there are two variants of this. You have HSMAC MD5 and HSMAC SHA 